five. Are you heading for your own winter of discontent? Four. The government has made a rod for its own back and it's handed it to the teaching unions to beat it with. You also understand the basic principle that the vaccines, at the beginning, it's the magic bullet scenario. They're going to affect transmission. And now we're starting to learn that's not the case. You're not just on a naughty step. Now you're nailed to the naughty step. Lashed down. One. (laughs) We have left off. Welcome once again to Planet Normal, the Telegraph podcast with Alison Pearson. Hello. And me, Liam Halligan. It's September, a time of new beginnings, a moment perhaps to look ahead. And as co-pilot Pearson and I cast our minds to the next few months, we're wondering, is Britain heading for a 1970s style winter of discontent? We both remember those old days, don't we, Alison? Society was fractious, politics embittered and deeply tribal. The UK's trade union seemed to rule the roost. Who governs Britain? That was the question then Prime Minister Edward Heath famously posed to the electorate, and they famously said, not you, mate, as they dumped him out of office. The public exhausted by spiralling inflation, a breakdown in public services, and an overwhelming sense of drift. Fast forward to today, and again, the cost of living is rising fast. Society's fraught, and this time, it's not the blue collar, but the white collar unions, the teachers and doctors telling the government what to do. As the kids go back to school, are we about to see a third successive academic year sacrificed on the altar of zero COVID zealotry? And as for getting a face-to-face appointment with your GP, vital if medics are to spot life-threatening conditions and catch them early, well, official figures show, Alison, that since lockdown restrictions eased, the share of in-person consultations has remained unchanged at 56%, down from 80% before this ghastly pandemic. You're deeply concerned, aren't you, co-pilot, about ongoing upheaval in schools? And the British Medical Association, the Doctors' Trade Union, they've put you on the naughty step. (laughs) Are you heading for your own winter of discontent? I am on the naughty step. How unfair. (laughs) All I do is reflect the frustration and anger of our listeners and readers and we get these insulting letters from big wigs at the BMA. Anyway, we'll come to that later. I think the big news, Halligan, surely is that we're all going to retrain and get our heavy goods vehicle licences because now you can get 52 grand if you drive a lorry for Waitrose. What do you think? That's more lucrative than writing newspaper column, <laughs> till I can say. <laughs> Sign me up. I know. I'll eat Yorkie bars for a living. Why not? <laughs> Other chocolate is available. (laughs) How many Trollope novels could I listen to as I power down the M1? (laughs) Yeah, anyway, we'll come back to the lorries crisis. As you said, co-pilot, schools in England and Wales go back today, Thursday. Of course, should be a special day, butterflies in the tummy, excitement, new shoes making blisters on your heels. I still remember, Liam, my... Freeman, Hardy and Willis black platform shoes, the teetering height of style in 1974. I had those. I think your size was a bit bigger. They were absolutely awful. My God. My God, the plastic on those. I mean, I felt I was the, oh God, I was the bee's knees. You know, when you're young and you just pressing your nose against the, the, the shop window, hankering after them. Anyway, nine ninety nine. those were the days. So, yeah, kids like we were back then should be a day of getting back to normal. 16 months of horribly disrupted education. Not only have kids lost hundreds of millions of teaching hours, but we've seen an epidemic of anxiety and depression. Just this week, Liam, we learned that in 2020, there were 231,791 prescriptions for antidepressants issued to children aged between 5 and 16. So if anyone's worrying about the collateral harm of lockdown, there we are. So schools should this week reopen without the dreaded bubbles, without masks, without the social distancing, which has made life so strange and unnatural for 9 million youngsters. And and it should be, Liam, a chance for kids to put all that behind them. But here we come, stirring her witch's cauldron. Mary Boosted, the Joint General Secretary of the National Education Union, warning parents to expect significant disruption, a reintroduction of tougher COVID measures by the end of September because of a rise in 
cases. And so here is Mary, you know, saying that there's a much higher prevalence of COVID in the community. We're only relying now on lateral flow testing. And she says that in Scotland, they haven't abandoned the safety precautions. But as we know, Liam, Scotland has kept stricter measures and has been rewarded with the highest rate of COVID in Europe. I've got lots of thoughts about this, Liam. You know, I'm actually feeling very, very upset and angry on behalf of our children and all children. As came through in your column this week, it's very, very powerful. But we see the government has made a rod for its own back and it's handed it to the teaching unions to beat it with. If you ramp up the fear, if you carry out millions of lateral flow tests on children every three days, which is the plan. I read that this week alone, the British government will be spending a hundred million pounds on tests. Imagine what you could spend in schools, what you could buy in schools for a hundred million quid. And guess what, Liam? We're going to find a lot of positive cases. The next few weeks, they're going to say cases are soaring, peaks, whatever. And then we're going to be back into the doom loop. And what I think now is I think that Gavin Williamson and the education department need to get a bloody grip and say no child is going home unless they've got symptoms. And we know that that's all that matters. What say you, co-pilot? Well, I know you've interviewed a guest that we'll come to who speaks exactly to this issue, uh, and I'm looking forward to that. But what strikes me as interesting is that the UK now seems to be not quite out on a limb, but certainly acting differently from countries like Germany and Denmark, not just Sweden, which was the outlier, which had a much more liberal approach to COVID for most of this pandemic, but other countries too are now taking a much less not cautious, but a much less zealous approach, acknowledging that COVID is with us, acknowledging that kids are going to get it. And that's probably how they will end up being safe because they'll build up natural immunity. Yeah, totally. And yet it seems that our, our, our teaching unions, not all teachers by any means, or even most teachers, because how many emails have we had, Alison, from teachers upset at their teaching unions being a bit too militant and opportunistic and political mm. and teachers scared who don't feel that way, scared to say what they think in the staff room because the union rep might overhear yeah. and they'll be reprimanded. So we're not saying all teachers by any means, but we've both written, haven't we, over the last week in The Telegraph, you and your latest column, me also, that we feel that the teaching unions and the doctors' unions are being so obstructive now about moving on to the next stage of handling COVID, a more realistic management of the virus rather than trying to prevent the virus and contain the virus from spreading anywhere. As other countries move on, Britain, I think driven by its unions above all, by these white-collar unions, seems to be taking a much, much more restrictive and damaging approach. And almost it's like hang the collateral damage to the rest of the population, if it's kids or, or, or people using the NHS, as long as the teachers themselves and the doctors themselves are safe. And is that a kind of throwback to the time when we were growing up and the blue collar unions were really running Britain and pushing the government around and it didn't matter what the rest of the country thought. Maybe that is an over-exaggeration. Maybe that's a step too far. But we both feel there's something in that, don't we? We both feel that there's a kind of sense of who's actually in charge here, the elected government or a bunch of interest groups? I think that I'm afraid, Liam, I've got a sneaking suspicion that keeping the cases high really suits quite a lot of people. Let's be clear. We are mass testing millions of healthy children with this thing called Innova's Rapid Lateral Flow Test. This test is so bad, it's about to be discontinued in the United States because a scathing report from their Food and Drugs Administration. They said it should be put in the bin, they right? I mean, this is, this is <laughs> one of the most reputable regulatory bodies in the world. That's it. Yeah, absolutely. And they, <sighs> and they said that this, this fantastic test, now let's just think, co-pilot, what are the implications of this statement? The Innova rapid lateral flow test doesn't seem to be able to tell the difference between COVID and flu. So let's think as we go into the winter, 
What could possibly go wrong with uh, being unable to tell the difference between COVID and flu and presumably any other respiratory infection? It's absolute lunacy. But I worry that keeping, as I said, keeping these case figures unnaturally high when children aren't sick at all is really suiting to people. As you've said, it suits the teaching unions. They're absolutely thrilled. They can use it as leverage to make ever more unreasonable demands of the hated Conservative government. I don't know if you saw this. I think one of my favourite facts of the week, Gavin Williamson, excellent Secretary of State for Education, (laughs) has just given schools... 25 million quid to spend on 300,000 CO2 monitors to alert staff and students if fresh air is failing to circulate. You think, open the bloody windows. 25 million quid. We'd go around Halligan <laughs> opening the bloody windows, wouldn't we? But we've also got the government. Does it does it suit the government for the test results to be high? The government we know from our scoop last week from a source within the vaccination programme, the government is keen to push on with the vaccination of 12 to 15 year olds. And so high case numbers are terrific for that, aren't they? And yet what I would say, Liam, is this is against the latest science. The most recent research from Israel found that the twice jabbed can both be infected by COVID and they can pass it on. So vaccinating kids who don't require protection against severe symptoms, as the older people do, is absolutely bloody futile. Sorry, I'm using bloody too much today. What I would say to you, co-pilot, is we should not be wasting millions of vaccines on kids who don't need them. We should now urgently be pushing on with a booster programme for the elderly, for residents of care homes who accounted for a third of all COVID deaths tragically. And if the immunity generated by vaccines is waning, we need to be piling in now to build up the immunity with a booster campaign. And I think actually, Halligan, I think your co-pilot, never knowingly understanding the science, I think this is now what the JCVI is saying. I think that uh, we heard at the weekend, rather shockingly, that ministers are frustrated at the JCVI for not waving through casually the vaccination of 12 to 15 year olds who don't even need the vaccine. But the JCVI, it looks, Halligan, as though they think, hang on, shouldn't we be doing a booster campaign for those who actually need it? Just to clarify something, you said, are we keeping tests unreasonably high? And I know what you're getting at because we've discussed it on various episodes of Planet Normal and when we're not recording as well. What we're saying is that the testing rate in the UK is very high. Very high. And the important metric is the percentage of tests conducted which are positive. Now, as it happens, I'm just looking up the excellent R World in Data website. Here we go. He's got his stats. Let's go. <laughs> we don't need Velma. We don't need these pesky kids. We just need scoobs. So I'm looking at the R World in Data. I'm in the bowels of the website. And th- so this data is from the third week of August because it's the latest I can get for comparable countries. And in Germany, where there's a lot less testing going on, right? There's 7.9% of all tests are positive. But in the UK, where there's much, much more testing going on, 4.4% of all tests are positive. Wow. So, of course, we have much higher numbers of cases because we're testing so many more people. (laughs) Yeah. And the important metric, as I've banged on about in my writing, in my broadcasting, earwigging cabinet ministers as I'm sure you have been, the important metric is the percentage of tests that are positive because that gives you a representation compared to other countries of where COVID actually is. Yes, that's right. And I do think, Liam, I do think that the you know the only pandemic now is the pandemic of panic, as you've just said. Even you truffling around in your world data. That was really interesting, Liam, that 
In the Telegraph, we had Miriam Cates. She's a Tory MP for Peniston and Stockbridge. She's on the back benches. A lot of the back benches, conservative back benches, starting, I think, to get quite restless about the gap between what's going on and what the data is saying. And Miriam says, if the alarming lack of evidence, this is about testing kids in schools, isn't enough, Surely the financial cost should bring us to our senses. Lateral flow tests costing between five and thirty pounds each. If every secondary school student takes two COVID tests at the start of the term, we are about to spend in the region of one hundred million pounds on testing children in just one week. That is enough to pay the salaries of more than three thousand teachers for a whole year. And Miriam, she's writing as a mum, isn't she? As it's. For her, it's not just about the economics. She's no. writing as a mum. She is writing as a mum and she concludes, the mass testing of healthy children feels like an out-of-control train gathering momentum. There is no longer any meaningful destination and it's time to jump off. Hear, hear, Miriam Cates. Absolutely agree with that. Strong words for a young MP who, you know, is clearly fair play to her saying, to hell with my future <laughs> as a potential government minister, I'm going to tell it as it is. This is what I feel as a mum. This is what I'm hearing at the school gates. This is what needs to be said. But we need to talk about your your row with the (laughs) British Medical Association, Alison. And then I know you've got some more statistics from another secret source. I know, another secret source. My name is Mud Halligan, apparently in the in the higher echelons of the British Medical Association. They read your columns with anger and despair. Anger and despair. That's how I feel when I'm writing them, so God knows. But yes, Dr Richard Vautry, the chair of the GP committee of the British Medical Association, did indeed write to the Telegraph complaining about reading my dreadful column in which I pointed out that lots of people couldn't get in touch with their GP. I was quite glad to see that Dr. Vautry was filled with despair and anger because that's how many of us feel when we think about the devastating, heartbreaking stories we've had from listeners of Planet Normal and Telegraph readers. And Dr. Vautry said, you're going to love this, Liam, we know that remote appointments are not perfect. (laughs) (laughs) Try getting one, mate. How many phone calls do you have to make? Yeah, so that's like saying Alison's maths isn't top top notch. I think the GP's (laughs) trade union position seems to be, Liam, that because many family doctors are, quotes, at the end of their tether, we should all shut up nicely and acquiesce in the substandard primary care, which is causing so much suffering in case we undermine doctors and cause them to quit. Now, this sounds a lot like emotional blackmail to me, Liam. I, I get angry when I hear from a reader that a receptionist told an 87-year-old lady to send a selfie of a growth on her back or she wouldn't be allowed to see the doctor. And apparently, according to the BMA and Dr Richard Vautry, we're supposed to suck up that kind of cruel, negligent, frankly inhuman treatment because we mustn't upset the poor doctors who think they are doing a marvellous job. And I, I suppose what I'd say to you, Liam, is do Dr. Bortry and the BMA think all the readers and listeners sharing their grim experiences are lying or do they just not care? We should say again, to be clear, we know many doctors. We went at university with many people who are now distinguished and very hardworking and heroic doctors. We are not having a go at all doctors at all. What we are doing is responding to what we hear in the communities. We live in to the experiences we have in our own families and above all to the hundreds, the hundreds, Dr. Vautry, of people who have emailed Planet Normal from month to month throughout the pandemic. This has been probably the most consistent theme in the huge number of emails that we get related to this podcast and to our own respective Telegraph columns I can't get a GP appointment. I'm really trying to get a GP appointment. I'm not saying that there's no usefulness to e-consulting. Of course there is in moderation. If someone like me needs a repeat prescription, I don't need to take up doctor's time. I don't need to sit in a waiting room full of other sick people and risk getting ill myself. That can be done with a consultation online. 
that of course the technology can help us, but it is no substitute in many, 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 many cases for the in-person consultations in which, again, countless medics have told us, we're not medics, countless medics have told us, you have those soft signs that a doctor can pick up, the way people look and move, the, the sound of their voice touching a patient as part of a preliminary examination. All these things are absolutely vital and that is what doctors are trained at huge public expense to do. And that's what they need to be doing. And of course, we need to train far, far more doctors. Do. Why do we have to steal doctors from other countries? It's immoral. It's like it's a closed shop. We're not training enough doctors. Why do you have to get you know, absolutely perfect GCSEs and A-levels to have any hope of getting to medical school in this country. You don't need, you need to be very, very smart, of course, but you don't need to have absolutely perfect exams throughout. The bar to get into medical school is far too high. The number of doctors we're training is far, far too low. We need to train more. We need to use e-consultation. Of course we do, but we need to get back to a situation where if ordinary men and women for themselves or their families need to get a doctor's appointment, they don't have to go through this quite astonishing phone triage, It's as which is often very, very vociferous and obstructionist. They don't need to be sent into these Kafkaesque systems where they fill in the e-form and then they're told to try and get a doctor's appointment. And then when they talk to the receptionist, they're told to fill in the e-form. It goes round and round and round. And that's why organizations like Macmillan, hugely respected charities uh, that support cancer patients and their families are, quotes, deeply concerned about the number of undiagnosed cancers that, are, that there have been. And it's not just cancer, it's other conditions too. And this is one of the big, big, big drawbacks of the lockdown that we've seen. And those conditions must not go on into the future, whatever the BMA says. I totally agree. And we did see this week that the NHS was going to further incentivise GPs, if you can believe it, to do more online telephone consultation. It seems to be absolutely flying in the face. In fact, it seems to be spitting in the face of what the public say that they want. Should we should we have a bit of George Halligan? We haven't we haven't had George for a while, have we? Oh, deep throat in NHS England. Yes, of course. So George is a senior source within NHS England. He or she, we don't disclose, has full access to the internal data. We're very confident of the authenticity of George's statistics. That's why we report them. But by definition, we can't independently verify them because George gives these figures to us before they're published, if indeed they're published at all. And it's a very interesting picture. As always, George gives us brilliant data, don't, don't they, Liam? As of today... There are 6,281 COVID patients in English hospitals. This does represent the highest number since the middle of March, but the number is creeping up rather than galloping. Given that we've just come out of a three-day weekend, the increase over the last three days is more likely to be due to a decrease in discharges rather than an increase in admissions. The rate of increase during July looked to be becoming an exponential trend, increasing from 1,600 to 5,000 in the space of a month. But by the end of July, the number of patients in hospital levelled off at around 5,000, which is where it stayed for a couple of weeks. Over the last month, George says there have been an average of 330 COVID admissions per day. That's people actually going into hospital with COVID and 400 patients per day diagnosed in hospital with covid after admission, after a test. You'll remember, Liam, that Sajid Javid, when he took over in the health department, promised to look into those two figures being combined by the NHS and giving a vastly misleading picture of how many people are actually going into hospital with COVID. We're still waiting for those different figures, Mr Javid. But George continues, Daily discharges from hospital have averaged about 575. Those are people getting better from COVID. That means a net increase of around 160 patients each day. Now, this is really interesting, Liam. The age distribution of patients has changed significantly since January. But comparing the distribution now to what it was in May, there's little change. Currently, there are around a third of admissions in the 65 and over age group. For the younger age group, it's been the opposite way around, that the older age group, there are fewer of those in hospital, 
Uh, now the younger people, there are more younger people in hospital. Children under 18 represented just 2% of hospital admissions in January, but it's 6% now. And the largest increase has been in the 25 to 34 age group. However, George says, and this is very important, when you consider that there were over four times as many daily admissions in January as there were in early August, then the absolute numbers being admitted from all age groups is far less now than it was before the vaccine programme started in earnest. And there's one final thing, Liam, that really, really jumped out at me, and this is about the deaths. When we think of all this attempt to vaccinate children, George says, in terms of younger people, there's no evidence of an increase in them not recovering. Since March 2020, this is worth saying, there have been a total of 92,500 reported COVID deaths in English hospitals, and 99.2% of those were people aged 40 or over, with the majority being in the 80 plus or the 60 to 79 age group. That leaves just 740 total COVID deaths in the under 40s. And, says George, according to our dashboard, they were all in the 20 to 39 age group. There isn't even a section on the pie chart for any deaths under 20, or if there is, it's invisible to the naked eye. So we can ask ourselves justifiably, co-pilot, why would you be vaccinating people in an age cohort which has had almost zero deaths? Thank you to George anyway. Quite astonishing numbers from George. I don't know, Alison, I'm naturally an optimistic person. My heart really does sink. Maybe it's because I've got a lad going back to school and also because I'm I'm that age where I, you know, most of my friends are parents with school-age kids. It really is, your heart sinks. I must say that, to be fair, opinion among my friends who are parents about the vaccination of 12 to 15-year-olds is split. Some people are vociferously against it, even if they've had the jabs themselves and they're not anti-vax, they're pro-vaccination. Mm. Mm. But like you, they look at the balance of risks and they say it doesn't make any sense. Others are just like, I'll just give them the jab, it, it will be fine. And if the teaching unions do come across as really obstructionist in the next few weeks and months, and the doctors' unions too, about face-to-face consultations, I really do think that public patients will snap, not just with the unions, but with the government as well. Hello, I'm Christopher Hope, but my pals call me Chopper. And you can too. Just dropping into my second favourite podcast to tell you about another Telegraph show. Mine! As a Telegraph chief political correspondent, I spend my days holding politicians to account and asking them about the things that affect you. I speak to the top politicians from across the political spectrum, commentators with their finger on the pulse, and of course, my talented colleagues at the Telegraph. So if that sounds like your cup of tea, please search Chopper's Politics wherever you're listening to this. Cheerio! Someone who has been really concerned, Liam, about all these effects throughout society is Professor Carl Hennigan. For Planet Normal, there have been a few scientist heroes during the past 18 months, and Carl Hennigan is certainly among them. Carl is the Professor of Evidence-Based Medicine at Oxford, and he also works weekend shifts as an emergency GP, which he says allows me to see healthcare from both sides. Of course, you'll know, Liam, that Carl Hennig has become very prominent throughout the pandemic, consistently making the case for a more balanced approach based on real-life data, not on mathematical models. In September last year, Professor Hennig, alongside Professor Shunetra Gupta and Professor Carol Sakura wrote an open letter to the Prime Minister asking for a rethink of the government's COVID-19 strategy. They argued in favour of a targeted approach to lockdowns, advising that only the over 65s and the vulnerable should be shielded. So after our Planet Normal scoop last week, in which a source in the vaccination programme told us that the plan was to start vaccinating 12 to 15-year-olds from 6th of September, I asked Professor Carl Hennigan, 
Can a 12-year-old give informed consent to a COVID vaccine? I think the first thing is to say when you develop vaccines like this, generally what you want to do is develop an evidence base that ensures safety. And when I look at the evidence, there's been a randomised controlled trial done in America, published in the New England Journal of Medicine, but the follow-up is only two months, as I could ascertain. Now, normally, in normal times, we'd probably run a study for a year or two years to assess safety in this situation. And this is the problem throughout COVID times. It's tended to be a rush, hasn't there? As though we've got a fix around the corner. And we've done this now for months on end. Last summer, it was about masks. It was about social distancing, restrictions. Now it's about the vaccines. If we just vaccine the school age children, we'll have another magic bullet. What concerns me here is that actually there is insufficient evidence right now to say this is a safe vaccine because you're missing out on those normal processes that we do in normal times. And this is a sort of anxiety we've got into COVID as though we're still in a major emergency. And one thing we could do is slow down the processes and ask real questions of the evidence base. So when people make a decision, it is incredibly important that they understand the benefits and the harms and they are quantified to you so you can make an informed decision about what to do next. If you can't do that, then you've got real problems in medicine to be able to make sound, sensible evidence-based decisions. Now, this is the cornerstone of medicine, how we function, how we practice, how I inform patients about treatments. And that's the key issue here. Quantification, please, of the benefits and harms so that we can pass on an informed decision. It's really interesting to hear you talking about that. As you say, it's from one thing to the next, isn't it? If we vaccinate this group of people, if we vaccinate that group of people, if we wipe surfaces and so on, on and on it goes. I saw that according to the latest study by Professor John Ioannidis at Stanford University, the infection survival rate for youngsters aged 0 to 19 is 99.9973%. Now, Carl, normally as a doctor, you wouldn't be giving a medical treatment to people in a group where there is almost zero mortality for the condition you're vaccinating against, would you? You're talking about, if you look at the sort of how many children have died under the age of 16 with COVID, the mortality rate is about two per million. But interestingly, if you look at that two per million, that's died with a positive PCR test for SARS-CoV-2. The majority of those children have underlying conditions. So, for instance, in America, they had leukemia. So you've got a major condition that affects your immune system. So you've identified the children that are most vulnerable and who will benefit likely from the vaccines. What Johnny Ardis is showing is what we started out with, with this case fatality rate, started out about 10%, but you use a very important term, infection fatality rate. What does this mean if you get the infection? And over time, that infection fatality rate has come down and down and down. And what you're describing in young children is that infection fatality rate is less than many other diseases and infections that are common in children. It's less than influenza. It's less than RSV, which is a common circulating virus that's circulating right now, and nobody is concerned about it. So I think these are important issues that you tease out that we have to think about when making decisions. And this comes back to a very important point about this pandemic. One of the most important issues is understanding the age structure of who's most affected. And pandemic theory suggests that actually when you have a pandemic is actually children are disproportionate affected. Therefore, their mortality is much higher. But very early on in this COVID outbreak, it was clear that the age structure of who dies, who's hospitalised, is massively towards those who are the very elderly. So over 75% of the deaths are in over 75s, over a third are in care homes. Once you understand that, you start to look at the whole pandemic and the impact on children differently. Today, Carl, is the day when kids in England and Wales go back to school after the summer holidays should be a very exciting, positive day. But we're already hearing teaching unions warning that learning may be disrupted later in September because cases are rising, that this is all spreading through the community. Do you think, A, should we be mass testing healthy kids in schools 
And would society be better off allowing children to catch COVID and gain the long lasting natural immunity, which studies from places like Israel are suggesting is superior to the immunity generated by the vaccination? So I think you make a very important point first up there, Alison, is that people are still very fearful about going about their daily lives. And that's because we've had 18 months consistently of messaging that tells you you should be afraid. You shouldn't go into certain places. And when you do go in certain places, you should mask yourself up. You should stay away from people. And as we've seen some of these interventions now become voluntary, about half the population is still going around in a very fearful way. So when we ask people to do certain things, like go back into a crowded place or a classroom at work, I can fully understand why people are anxious and why they're fearful. But I think this comes back to a very important point. This is almost a year ago we made this point, is if the messaging is one of fear, over time it will break down, but it will create significant anxiety in the population. And what breaks into that fear is continuing case numbers, mass testing, and all of the issues that go with this. And that creates the ongoing problem. Now, I think mm. where we are mm. in this pandemic is I only mm. think we've gone beyond what I consider is phase one. And phase one is people accepting that the virus is endemic. And it's took a long time to get there for many mm. people. Mm, the question has. now is phase two is how do we learn to live with that like we do with other respiratory viruses? And your point in children is with the other coronaviruses, by the time you get to 16, you've already picked them up. You will go into your adult life and they will recirculate. And every three to four years, you'll pick another one up and you'll get a cold and you'll feel a bit miserable, and you might get it in winter, more likely, sometimes in summer, but much more likely in winter. And the problem is, when you go into very later life, we have an issue called immunosenescence, where your immune system doesn't function as it does when it was particularly as a child or as an adult. And that's the population we should be looking after. So the point is now, is when do we start to have a grown-up debate about how we go into phase two to learn to live with this virus and how do we switch off some of the testing, the inordinate cost that comes with that, and repurpose that funding to where the most vulnerable and where the issues are in healthcare. I hear what you're saying, but the fact is, Carl, that this week millions of parents are going to be struggling at home, aren't they, with the dreaded lateral flow test, which doesn't give us a lot of hope going into the winter. But we will be mass testing school children from tomorrow. You know, you can put me right, but isn't it going to be the case we're going to be back in the doom loop of, oh, my God, you know, all the cases have gone up yeah. again even if it's largely healthy children, and then won't there be the pressure, oh my goodness, we must wear masks, they must go back into the dreaded bubbles. Isn't that what's going to happen? Well, I'm not a big fan of forecasting you know, and modelling and you know that, <laughs> but no. I think we're in for a difficult winter. And that's because this winter is the winter where we start to learn how to live with these issues going forward. As we go back to schools, you're right. What happens is you've got a new cohort of children going into primary school. You've got a new cohort going into secondary school. And in a few weeks, we've got a new cohort going into university. All of them will cause rises in a significant number of pathogens, rhinovirus, adenovirus, RSV, metanumavirus. I could keep going with the list. Nobody will bother about the ones that actually cause the most damage to children. What we've got is this fixation on COVID. And I think we're going to go through this winter and by next May, June, start to have a sensible conversation about switching some of these issues off. The most important thing for everybody out there is to help their children not to get anxious in these situations when the people around them are getting more anxious, the politicians are getting more anxious, mm -hmm. and they can go about their normal life while all of us adults around us are seemingly not actually acting like adults and we need to go back to mm, school mm. in effect to start yes. to think about the decisions we're impacting on children. So looking at this latest data from Israel, which seems to suggest there's a waning in vaccine effectiveness after about six months and that getting immunity from catching the virus looks like it's more effective than getting immunity from the jab. And yet there's still talk of these 
vaccine passports to giving the double jabbed access to certain larger events. I mean, Carl, how would that make sense if the people being allowed into the larger events were still capable of picking up and transmitting the virus? Well, the first thing is the sort of unintended consequences of poorly thought through policies. I mean, I went to an event in London where it was at the West End in a theatre and there were 1,500 people there. And it said, you've got to produce your vaccine passport or a lateral flow test. Now, just think about it. If there's 1,500 people and you're going to put people through, it probably takes about 60 seconds to check everybody's because you've got to get your phone out, show them your app, you've got to do that. Now, for 1,500 people, that's 1,500 minutes of time. And what happens at these events is it doesn't happen. And actually, maybe one person gets checked, but actually it's impossible to police this. So having this policy is a smokescreen. The second issue is I'm for vaccines where they show the benefit and the harms. And Alison, as you get older and as I get older, I'm including you in this. The problem is we've missed out on that childhood infection. That's what a pandemic is about. There's a new virus that's emerged that we didn't get at the right time when we were young. Therefore, we need a bit of protection while that population immunity builds up. Now, once you understand that basis, you also understand the basic principle that the vaccines at the beginning, it's the magic bullet scenario. They're going to affect transmission. And now we're starting to learn that's not the case. And it's OK, because most of the smart epidemiologists and virologists fully expected that to happen. And it's a bit like what happens with flu. You get your vaccine and years later, you have to come back for those that are the most vulnerable. So what I'd be doing now is seriously thinking about what's the policy in those over 75 and what's the policy in those under 75 with those critical comorbidities in this next winter and beyond. Now, when we talk about children and we're vaccinating them, OK, we're doing it now. But what's the policy going forward? Are you going to have boosters? Are you going to have annual vaccines? What does it look like? Because all that needs to be set out when you give that first vaccine. Here's what the future looks like. And I think what we're doing, again, is distracting from the main problem. Would it not make more sense? This isn't my, as you'll hear, this isn't my field of expertise. But given that immunity may be waning in those who've had double jab for the vaccine, wouldn't it make more sense rather than persuading younger cohort children to have a vaccine they don't really need? Should we not be looking at giving boosters to that elderly group and the vulnerable that you've identified? You're making perfect sense, Alison. That's where I'd be really, Hooray. <laughs> yeah, I'd be seriously worried. And I can tell you, as I go into care homes, which I still do, and there are outbreaks at the moment in care homes of COVID, that's the critical issue because this is the two things that really matter here. Over a third of the deaths are in care homes. And then you think of the problem that occurred in hospital-acquired infection. Those who are unwell going into hospital and got mm. the infection mm. in hospital. Mm. You've got about 60% of the problem there that you need to really seriously think about. You talked about the elderly. I've heard from a paediatric intensive care nurse that the wards are full, but they're not full of children with COVID. They're full of children with those other respiratory viruses you talked about because their immune systems haven't been primed properly, have they? Because they've been in lockdown. I also heard Carl very upsettingly about two children who'd died of sepsis because their parents had been fearful about bringing them to the hospital. Now, on Planet Normal, Liam and I have been very, very concerned about the collateral damage caused by lockdown and the non-pharmaceutical interventions. And I, I know it's a big concern of yours. Can you tell us about what you've experienced in your GP work, seeing the perhaps the unforeseen consequences of the lockdown policy? Yeah, so I think I think you, you've got quite a few points there. Is we're interfering with the normal processes of our immune system, particularly as young people come into adolescence and adulthood. In doing that, what you're seeing in other countries, you saw it particularly in Australia. As soon as you re-emerge, you get surges of other infections. One of them is RSV, which RSV gives a sort of upper respiratory tract infection, a cough, but in those under one can be debilitating and can lead to death and really serious infection. And it's one of those we really worry about. 
And it's been this immune gap that you've created. So we will see, as schools come back again, we'll see a resurgence of some of those infections. Now, that's what creates a complete havoc for parents, because this is the one policy I would enact. If you're symptomatic, you stay off school. Once you're back to normal, you go back to school. And if you had that policy, it'd be much more sensible for dealing with the pandemic. This is one question I think now we need to get to the bottom of, is how many people have actually had the infection, coronavirus? Now, this is quite interesting. If you look at the serology data, it suggests about 40% of school children have had the infection. If you look at the government staging data site, coronavirus.data.gov.uk, they actually suggest only about 10% of the population have had it because the summary there is about 6.7 million. But if you look at the ONS infection survey data, because I looked at it last week and I was like, wow, it's still pretty high in there. And that's the random sampling data set where they go in, test 100,000 people and say, this is percentage 1.3%. Now, if you go back, they go back to May last year. And if you total up all the numbers, it comes to 40%, same as the serology data. Now, they missed out March and April because it wasn't running. Remember, we had no test in March and April. So it could be as high as 50%. So the question I have now is if it's 40 or 50%, then the first question you have is, how well did all those interventions work in lockdowns and rules of six and tier systems if one in two people have ended up potentially with the infection? And these are the issues we now need to discuss. And we need to have a very clear understanding how many people have actually had this infection so far that can help us think about the policies. Carl, Planet Normal listeners will be hearing you speak in this marvellously calm, thoughtful way. But I'm thinking, isn't the professor of evidence-based medicine quite angry? I mean, COVID seems to have almost created a new religion of public health. There are COVID zero COVID zealots who think people like you and Professor Shanetra Gupta are very eminent, thoughtful people because you don't believe that lockdown is the one true faith, that you're wicked heretics who have to be cast out. Please be honest with us. Has it been painful or shocking for you, Carl, to be painted as someone who is at odds with the scientific evidence when the evidence is the air you breathe, isn't it? Yeah, I think it's been a, a real roller coaster. And and I guess, you know, there's been times when it's been slightly up and times when it's been pretty down. And, and I think the level of vitriol is quite something. At the end of the day, the bit that keeps me going, Alison, is when I look to my children and when I look to other people's children out there, I think, right, what's the most important message we do for the next generation? And my job is fundamentally is to explain research to a wider audience. And I feel compelled to keep doing that, even if the message is not one that suits the policy, suits the predominant narrative, is to push the evidence and try and explain what it means. There's a couple of things I try and do all the time is I never tell people what to do. That's why I don't like mandates. You have to inform people, inform them about the effects, what's the benefits, what's the harms, and what are the biases in this research that undermine those effects. If you do that well, people come to the right conclusions. That's been important. The second thing is I work with a vast array of people, and this is one of the most important points that does concern me. There's a huge number of people in the background who are very intelligent, very smart, been looking at this for a number of years, who will not come forward because they're too concerned about what might happen to them in the public arena because of what has happened to people like myself and Professor Gupta. And I think that's a real travesty, because I think if you heard from a wider perspective, wider voices, what would happen is the message would become more to the middle ground. And what's happened here throughout is we're lost in terms of it's all about next week. We've all got to put masks on. We've got to have restrictions. We've got to close schools. We've not got back to the classroom. And that's the predominant message you hear. And you don't hear a more balanced view. And I think this is where we need to get to. And we need our politicians 
and our people involved in policy to now really take these issues seriously about what's happening in the media, the social media world and the impact. So you can get the true reflection of the voices that will give you a more sensible way of going about policy and what to do next. I have to say, Alison, that was an incredible interview. I'm privileged enough to have met lots and lots of professors from Oxford University. He's right up there with the most impressive, isn't he? He's everything that a tenured professor should be. This is why professors have tenure, or it should be why they have tenure. So they can speak as they find, they can plough their own research furrows, and they can say what they believe is to be true. And I think it's absolutely outrageous that people like Carl Hennigan and others that we've featured on Planet Normal, like not least Sinetra Gupta, have been hounded by fellow academics. And it's, I think we're privileged that he appeared on Planet Normal. I absolutely love talking to him, Liam. He's so, so sensible and calm, isn't he? Lovely. Imagine if you were ill and having Carl come round, you'd be thrilled. I just want to say Boris would have been better off listening to Carl Hennigan than Professor Neil Ferguson. We, we'd be in a very different position now. And and, and finally, if uh, your wonderful interview with James Glancy last week, you know, we have these hugely impressive people in British life, don't we? And they're not always the ones in charge, sadly. Should we have some emails, Halligan? Should we go on to some some listener emails, a selection of the fantastic, often very funny, often very heartbreaking messages you send each week to planetnormal at telegraph.co.uk? Please keep them coming. We absolutely love hearing from you. Here's one, Liam, which is from a, uh, someone that's familiar to Planet Normal, Nick Stokes. Planet Normal listeners will remember that our campaign for face-to-face appointments began with a very moving email from Nick Stokes about his wife, Joy, who tragically died after trying many times and failing to get a GP appointment. Nick writes to us, I thought it was high time you heard from me again, given that the supposed changes prompted by Joy's story have predictably not taken effect. I can confirm that my surgery and other local surgeries, according to their patients, continue to operate to COVID rules. And it is just as difficult to see a GP as it was when Joy was suffering. My surgery is open, but the waiting room is always empty and the contact process is as frustrating as ever. Yet I can see an aromatherapist and my osteopath for treatment within a few days. But of course, the difference is that I am paying for each visit. Sadly, as many of your listeners and readers say, the fundamental problem is that GPs are paid per list numbers and not on patient contacts, and they've adapted the way they operate to take advantage of this model. Clearly, there are GPs who do still see caring for their patients as their raison d'etre, but sadly, the BMA and the the wretched Dr. Richard Vautry see looking after their members as the only thing that matters. I was talking to two retired GPs at the weekend who are astounded by the BMA's response and are appalled that their old profession has practitioners who hold this view. They cannot understand how any GP cannot see that patients must always come first. Anyway, Liam and Alison, please keep up the campaign and I hope and pray for the sake of patients like Joy that one day real change will be forced on the BMA and their ilk. All the best to you and Liam. Lovely to hear from you, Nick. Thanks so much. Planet Normal regulars will recognise the name Nick Stokes, won't they? They'll also recognise the name Robert Styler. Haven't we had some wonderful correspondence over the months that we've been doing Planet Normal, Alison? And here's another wonderful email. This is from Helen. Dear Liam and Alison, my daughter called 201 times. Oh. Yes, 201 this morning before she finally got through to a doctor's receptionist. Having got a letter from the hospital saying my four-year-old granddaughter needs a face-to-face consultation as she has severe eczema and needs to be seen to assess her treatment and medication, she was told she would have to phone a consultation first with a doctor. And guess what? The earliest one is next Tuesday, a week away. Disgraceful when I read that doctors are supposedly now open on the one hand, then read that they're going to earn 100 quid per telephone consultation. I know which one to believe. Please keep up the good work and all best wishes to Planet Normal. Here's one 
again on this problem with seeing doctors. I'm going to struggle to read this out, Liam, but I just want to begin by saying to Dr. Richard Vautry in the BMA, that this is from a fantastic woman who's written about the experience she and her husband had. This is from Philippa. I was interested in your column talking about GPs not being there. Like you, I find e-consult deliberately obstructive. As I told my surgery, if I went to accident and emergency as much as it told me to, I would be permanently there. The real reason I'm writing is that due to GPs, district nurses and the palliative care team not doing their jobs properly, my husband died at home with me in agony. He was bleeding from his mouth, nose and backside. In his agitation, he fell and banged his head. My husband had cancer. He was told that he could die peacefully at home with the help of medications provided by the palliative care team and I could be with him. His cancer was spreading rapidly and he had put on four stone in nine days. His stomach and arms and legs were swollen. I wasn't allowed to see him until the last night before he came out of hospital. The only way we communicated was with panicky texts. The next morning, without me being with him, he was told the situation was terminal. The palliative care team had no weekend or 24-hour service and didn't seem to understand the urgency of my husband's situation. I spent all of his final six days trying to get care, attention and medications for him. On his final morning, my friend rang our GP for someone to administer his end-of-life sedatives and morphine. However, she was told by a rude receptionist that the doctor would ring back to see if he needed a visit. In our desperation, we rang 999. However, he had already passed away by then. The ambulance medics were very angry and said that GPs are using COVID to not do their job. I would be really pleased if you include some of my husband's story. It's a sad fact of life that we all have to die sometime. And in a supposedly civilised country like the UK, we all assume, don't we, that we will have help, support and medications to help us. I enclose for you and Liam some of the documentation around my husband's case, including the report from the hospice and a letter from the GP admitting some of their many failures so that you know I am not making it up, Philippa. I know, we can't say, go on, Halligan, go on, go on. We just, we'll keep, we're going to keep banging on about this. They're not going to get us to keep quiet, are they? <laughs> you're not just on a naughty step. You've, now you're nailed to the naughty <laughs> I step. Know, nailed, I know. Lashed down. <laughs> Harold to the naughty step. Why does she keep saying these things about people not getting treatment? Why does she keep going on about it? How could it be true? <laughs> In your Freeman Hardly and Willis shoes. <laughs> shoes, I know. <laughs> platforms, platforms. Right, I'm going to do one more. Yeah, do one I'm more. I'm going to do one more. This one's from Eddie because I know you did take a shine to uh, our guest last week, James Clancy. I most certainly did, yes. Eddie said, the Planet Normal interview with Afghan Raw Marines veteran James Clancy was one of the best I've heard on your show. Yeah, yeah. People like him who actually know and care about Afghanistan are like the stick in the centre of candy floss. Solid. In contrast to the airy-fairy nonsense provided by the vast majority of politicians and the media on this subject for the last 20 years. Thanks a lot, Eddie. And I think we'll end with some tactical tips from Crow. <laughs> I've discovered the best way to get around the GP booking system is to phone NHS Direct, explain your symptoms, and then they refer you and your GP is compelled to see you because your case is logged in the system. Shame we have to resort to such devious methods just to see a doctor. That's a good one, Liam, isn't it? One to file away. Good advice there. And on that bombshell, that is it from Planet Normal for another week. As we leave our sanctuary of sweet reason, our flying refuge of reasoned views, email of the week, it's your turn, Alison. Well, I suppose we've got to give it to Philippa. It was such a such a heartbreaking and solemn email, and I'm not sure that a Planet Normal mug would, would really cover it, but um, I think she's our winner, Liam, and, and, and we'll be in touch with her and send all of our best, uh, Philippa, from Planet Normal listeners. Absolutely. 
If you enjoy Planet Normal, please leave us a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. It does really help other people to find us so the Planet Normal family can grow. And every Thursday morning, Telegraph subscribers can talk to me on the Telegraph website, you lucky things. Find the article labelled Planet Normal, leave a comment beneath it, and I will get back to you from 11 to 12 noon. We do have some really good conversations there. It is you, our sensible, worldly wise, compassionate Telegraph readers and Planet Normal listeners who make this podcast. We learn a lot from you and we really love being in touch. We certainly do. Keep the emails coming. And as we speed away from Planet Normal and the madness of Planet Earth looms into view, thanks as ever to our producers, Louisa Wells, Isabel Bouchard, Elliot Lampitt, and our editor, Theodora Leludis. Stay safe, in touch with us and with each other. And until next week, it's goodbye from me. And it's goodbye from him.